If you're a student of world history, if you like to read about the way that human civilization has gone over time, you start to see some cycles. You start to see this happens, then this happens, and then this happens, and usually there's some kind of destruction, and then it comes back around again. We're seeing that in America, right? American history even has cycles, economically, um, uh, attitudes, um, crises. seems like the, the same things come up over and over and over again. And if I live uh, long enough, I will see exactly what's going on in our country now, happen again in about 30 to 40 years, right? There are just these cycles. There are times of peace and there are times of war. There are times of prosperity. And there are times of lacking or wanting. There are times of health and there are times of sickness. Now, it's true that we see these cycles in the human experience, but it's also true that we as Christians believe that time is not cyclical, but it is linear, that there's a beginning and there's an end. And the Bible talks about those in the beginning and in the end, right? There's, there's this idea that uh, it, it, it's not like there's a series of birth and rebirth. It's a series of, of spiraling down. Things are getting worse and worse. And every once in a while, God will intervene with a flood to destroy all the wicked and start over with righteous Noah or uh, things are getting worse and worse and God brings Israel in or revives Israel or sends Christ and Christianity. There are things that God has done to stop the spiral to get as bad as it was back in Noah's day. But we also understand that even through all those cycles and spirals, there is a linear idea to time. That God, there was a beginning with Adam and Eve and there will be an end when Christ returns and there will be a judgment at the end. And through all of that, because of the past, we can kind of predict some of the, the future in some way. There are human tendencies. But there is in us, especially us who know the Lord, this kind of longing that this cycle would be done. That all of this ups and downs, that, that the cycle of human cruelty to one another, which is, again, slowly getting worse in some ways, that all of that would end. And this is the kind of longing that Christians have. The very end of the book of Revelation, the very end of the Bible, some of the last words ever written are these. He which testifieth these things saith, surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. That is, there is that longing that when Jesus says, I'm coming back, we say, good. that's a good thing. I'm looking forward to that. There's a kind of longing that all God's people have that he would rescue us. And when we look at Revelation and all that happens throughout that very confusing book, especially in the period called the Great Tribulation, culminating, it all culminates at the end in Revelation 19 in what is called the Day of the Lord. And this Day of the Lord is a theme of Scripture, but it's especially a theme in the book of Joel. That phrase, Day of the Lord, is found 31 times in Scripture, five in the book of Joel. Now again, just for context, 31 times in all of Scripture, all 1,189 chapters, in three of those chapters, that is found five times. So this is a major theme in the book of Joel. The Day of the Lord is meant to be a day when God would show up. So most people think of God as not really, kind of in the background, kind of like, you know, even people that say, well, I believe in God, they kind of want God to be in the, in the background, kind of the unseen hand guiding certain things, but not certainly prevalent and relevant in everyday life. It's just kind of, he's there, but there's coming a day where he can't be ignored. That's the day of the Lord. <laughs> There's a day he's going to manifest himself in a specific way where all the peoples of the earth are going to not doubt, is there a God? Now, when God shows up, there's going to be a choice. I either have already aligned myself with him and I'm glad for his coming, or I hate him and I want to fight against him. Even the Lord, as he comes out of heaven, people are going to fight against him. doesn't make sense, but that is this day. And this is a good day for God's people, that he would be with them. Here in Joel chapter 2, verse 27, Ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. He says, The day of the Lord is a good thing for my people, 
But then it's a bad day for God's enemies. Look at chapter 3, verse 2. I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people. And for my, they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. God says, in the end, I'm going to grab all the nations of the world. I'm going to bring them to the valley of Gehenna, the, the valley that runs south along Jerusalem, the valley of Jehoshaphat. He calls it later the valley of decision. That's where I'm going to judge the world. And all of those people are going to be frightened by that. That's a terrifying prospect. But of course, all of God's people are going to be glad that finally all their enemies are going to get theirs. In verse number nine, proclaim ye this among the Gentiles, prepare war, wake up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near, let them come up, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears, let the weak say, I am strong, assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about, thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord, let the heathen be wakened and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full. The fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. And again, there's that picture where one day all of the world's armies, all the world's captains will come together and all of them will be judged. And that'll be a good day for Jerusalem and for Israel and for God's people. We, of course, look at things a little bit differently. What is this day of the Lord, and what does it mean for Christians? Where do we find ourselves in this cycle? When God says, here, beginning, here, end, where do we find ourselves? Now, I'm not going to go through a lot of prophecy here this morning, um, just because that's not really the purview of the book of Joel, but Joel is talking about there is this longing for the day of the Lord. There is a day when all of this is going to be made right, and those who are wicked are going to get theirs, and those who are right are going to get theirs by the grace of God, and that should be a good thing. But there's a few things that Joel is going to talk about, because this is a book of warning, not just to the Gentile nations, but also to Israel. Make sure you get on the right side of the day of the Lord. So let's talk about, first of all, a dress rehearsal for the day of the Lord. So God was warning Israel, but they'd already experienced some of God's wrath. So go back to chapter 1 in Joel, Joel 1, verse number 5. Awake, ye drunkards, and weep and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion." He hath lain, laid my vine waste, and he and barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean bare and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. Look at verse 10. The field is wasted, the land mourneth, for the corn is wasted, the new wine is dried up, the oil languisheth. Verse 15, alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Is not the meat cut off before our eyes, yea, joy and gladness from the house of our God? The seed is rotten under their clods, the garners are laid desolate, the barns are broken down, for the corn is withered. How do the beasts groan? The herds of cattle are perplexed, because they have no pasture, yea, the flocks of sheep are made desolate." O oh Lord, to thee will I cry, for the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and the flame hath burned all the trees of the field. The beasts of the field cry also unto thee, for the rivers of water are dried up, and the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. This army came up and destroyed the nation of Israel, and, and the people in the, that Joel was writing to had experienced all of this. And you say, wow, what army came and just took out all of the vegetation and all the bark off the trees? It was bugs. It was insects. It was swarms of locusts and other things. Look at verse number one, or chapter one, verse number four. That which the palmer worm hath left, the locust hath eaten. And that which the locust hath left, the canker worm hath eaten. And that which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. Look at chapter two. Verse 2, a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not yet ever been the like, neither shall any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as a garden of Eden before them. 
It's nice. It's well watered. It's beautiful. And behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses. They and as horsemen, so shall so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the top of mountains shall they leap. Like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble. As a strong people set in battle array before their face, the people shall be much pained. All their faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. And they shall. March every one of his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great. For he is strong that executeth his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Now, I've never seen personally a swarm of locusts, but if you've ever looked at video of that, especially in places where they don't have a lot of control, where they're still dealing with these, America seems to have gotten a lot of that under control through different pesticides and things, but um, you do some uh, do a search this afternoon on the internet, and you'll find videos of these swarms of locusts. And it's a terrifying thing to think about this, you know, billions of bugs descending on your farm and there's zero you can do about it. Um, I, again, I don't know what that's like, but uh, I used to read the kids, the Little House on the Prairie series. And in one of the books, I don't remember which one, I think it was the Plum Creek book. I'm pretty sure it was that one, but there's this one scene where the, they plan all their things and pause like, this is going to be the greatest year ever. And then the locusts come. And the way that he, the way that Laura describes these locusts, not just how they ate everything, but how it's at some point, all of them just kind of went click and they all just kind of turned their attention and walked away. It's the exact same what it talks about here, this, that all those locusts, they don't break rank. They climb over walls and they eat everything. And then all of a sudden they just decide it, it, like at once we're all going to go somewhere else. And like an army, they just move on. And God says, that's my army. That's, that's a precursor for the day of the Lord. And what he's trying to say is this. If you're devastated when there's bugs, just wait. It gets much, much worse. This is just insects. What about when people come through? What about when it's an actual army of people? What about when there's actual calamity in your uh, in your experience. And again, we've, we've had warnings every once in a while. In America, in 1929, there was nine years of growth followed by a loss of 14 billion in one day, Black Tuesday. In 1987, we had five years of growth followed by one day, a drop in the stock market, a loss of $1.71 trillion. Do um, you remember on 9-11, right after that, the stock market crashed again and it recovered because there was you know, some obvious reasons for why there was so much uncertainty. But maybe you don't remember, on uh, September 12th, the stock market lost $1.4 trillion in one day. Nobody saw it coming. There was no kind of market indicators. It was just 19 men got on planes and destroyed the American economy for just a little while. In 2008, again, we had more of that. And all that to say, these are just little warnings that show you just how fragile things are. I'm not trying to freak anybody out. I'm just saying that God brings these warnings into your life to say, hey, get back on the right track. Before I send the real army, before I send everything that's going to be devastating, I'm going to show you just my power. I'm going to send a few bugs and a few worms. And, and if they can devastate and there's nothing you can do about it, then what happens when I let this human army come in as well? All these are a warning. And again, it's meant to show how weak we really are, that everything is going really well until you get a bad doctor's report, until you have a really big expense that you weren't counting on, until you have an ended relationship or the death of a loved one that you were not expecting. And it's, so it's important to build a relation, your life around a relationship with God because not only can these things happen, these precursors to the day of the Lord, but they do happen. And if all of your being and all of your worth is tied up in 
transitory things, then you're going to have a crash at some point. The day of the Lord, little d for you, is, is very likely to come. And it's important for you to plug in now and have a relationship with God now and to be involved in God's people and understanding where you are and understanding scripture and the way God does things now because then you're not going to be as interested. Then you're going to be desperate. So much better to understand that and to in to in Salate yourself now with scripture and this relationship. Everything that's, that's happened is a warning for us. And so we're to watch for the day. So that's the dress rehearsal for the day. And then we have the real day of the Lord. So in chapter 2, verse 30, I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke, and, and the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord Come, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be delivered, for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. For behold, in those days and in that time when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. There will be signs that the end is near. The Jewish people were looking forward to that day, but what Amos says, uh, we read Joel and then we read Amos right after that. He says, I don't know why you Jewish people are looking forward to the day of the Lord. He says in chapter 5, verses 18 and 20, Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light, as if a man did flee from a lion and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned his hand upon the wall and a serpent bit him. Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? There are days of God's wrath on them too. There are days coming where people ought to be afraid of God's anger and wrath. Now we Christians understand that we will escape the worst of the day of the Lord. Over in 1 Thessalonians, it says this, Yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night, rather without warning. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. He says, they won't escape, but you will because you're going to be ready. Now, I believe in this church teaches in a pre-tribulational rapture. And that just means this, that there is a time coming in the future, again, called the Great Tribulation. Most of what the book of Revelation describes is entailed in that seven-year period where the Antichrist is here, um, where great sin is on the earth, and then all the all the things you read about in Revelation, the hailstones and the fire and the water turning to blood and uh, things that... Again, nobody has any control over at all. It is a time when God is going to pour out his wrath. And there's always this question, all right, so how much of that are born-again Christians going to go through? And I believe the answer is none, that the rapture is coming at the beginning of that seven years and that, the, that what the Bible says here in 1 Thessalonians 4, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up, or the Latin word rapturo, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The Bible doesn't spell out exactly, now this is happening this time. But if you put scriptures together, I believe the best explanation is that that happens before the tribulation. So now when does the tribulation start? We don't know exactly the only, as far as when. The only thing that we know is that Daniel tells us, Daniel 9, we're not going to get there this year, we're going to get there in the spring, but uh, Daniel 9 tells us that the beginning of that seven-year period starts with um, a covenant that the Antichrist makes with Israel. So, again, are we close to that? Well, we don't know who the Antichrist is, so we don't know, right? We don't know a lot of things, but we can see in Scripture that uh, there's going to be a focus on Iran. There's going to be a focus on the North, Russia, and the East, China. There's going to be a focus on Israel. Israel's going to be making a lot of covenants, and all those things we're seeing today, right? So we can say, boy, it might even happen in my lifetime that all of this will happen, and if I'm saved, if I'm a born-again believer, then I believe I'm going to be 
taken out, caught up together with the Lord, and I'll miss that seven-year tribulation. That would be a great thing, because part of that is this day of the Lord. So he says that in chapter 5, verse 9, The Lord, for God hath not appointed us to wrath. This is I'm in 1 Thessalonians. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6, Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe. Um, so again, we, we as Christians will be glad to see God as a rescuer. We will be glad for Christ's return. But that doesn't mean that we will escape hardship. Okay, so can we say, I believe that we will escape the capital D, capital A, capital Y, day of the Lord. And, that, and yet that doesn't mean that we're going to escape all troubles, tribulations. You know, I, I talk to people and they say, oh boy, persecution is getting worse in the world. I believe the rapture is going to happen. And I, 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 I believe that the rapture is, could happen at any time as well. But I, the, the subtle insinuation is, that as soon as things get really hard for me as a Christian in America, that must mean that Jesus is coming back because Jesus doesn't want me to suffer at all. And that I don't think is true. Oh, I don't know what's going to happen in America, right? I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know how the tables are going to turn on Christians. I don't want to be a fear monger. Right now, we enjoy awesome and amazing freedom. But freedom goes away very quickly under circumstances that we can't control. And in some ways, again, the last four years have shown us it doesn't take very much for people, wicked people in power, to seize that power and to take away even the things that we enjoy, like our freedoms. We have to understand that and not just and not be disappointed when we go through hard things because, yes, okay, it's true. We will escape the very worst of it. But it's an American thing to think that we shouldn't suffer at all. Talk to brothers and sisters all around the world who are suffering under oppression, people that hate Christianity and the Bible. And you'll find out that they're not expecting the rapture to come and rescue them in the same way that we are. So it's okay for us to understand. What, what is this day of the Lord? It is when he will be fully manifested. Right now, God shows himself in creation, in the conscience, in scripture. He has shown himself through his word, but then he will be revealed to the world. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, it says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. And then it says, Even so, amen. <laughs> like, that's a terrifying thing for somebody else, but for me, mm, more of that. Yes, please. <laughs> I want him to appear. I want Christ to be on this earth. I want him to establish his kingdom. I want to be a part of all of that. I'm not afraid of that at all. And I'm not afraid of what might have to happen in order for me to get to that point, right? So I understand the day of the Lord. The proper perspective is me then. For me is then to say, Lord, even so, come quickly. I'm going to do what I can because I know that time is is short for many others who will not be looking forward to the day of the Lord, even as I am. But then let's talk about the precursor to the day of the Lord, because the Jewish people are always asking, where are we in this timeline? As you read through chapter two, you see, uh, you know, there's, there's good, there's hard things. Where are we in all of this? And the Jewish people have gone through times of both. They, uh, the Assyrians had come in, uh, and they're gone. In chapter two, verse 20, again, I will remove far off from you the northern army. I don't think it's talking about locusts anymore. I think he's saying, now just like I got rid of the locusts and the, the palmer worm and the caterpillars, I can get rid of this army, the Assyrians as well. And God did exactly that. Remember, a uh, huge army came in, surrounded Jerusalem, no hope. Hezekiah prays. One night, one angel kills 185,000 Assyrians and Sennacherib goes back home uh, with his tail between his legs, is worshiping of the God in the temple of his God and gets killed by his sons. And that's biblically, historically, that's what happens. And God brings a great deliverance. And so the Jewish people understand that and they say, what a good God. 
But then things get bad again, and the Babylonians come in, and they're thrown into captivity. But 70 years later, Cyrus the Persian comes, takes over the Babylonian Empire, and he sends the people back to Jerusalem. And they say, this is great, but then the Seleucids take over, and the Greeks take over, and they're trying to Hellenize that area, and there's oppression again. But the Maccabeans come, and they revolt against the oppressors, and they have their freedom, and then the Romans come in. And that's where the people in the first century find themselves, this cycle of up and down, up and down, these little days of the Lord that have culminated now, and they're saying, what, when is all of this going to end? They were yearning for the Messiah, the one who would come and deliver them. And yet when the Messiah came, they rejected him in favor of political hopes instead. And because of their rejection of the answer, the Romans came and crushed them, destroyed the temple, and they haven't had one since. That's a pretty amazing thing. It's one thing to say, oh yes, there was this Baha'i temple over in you know, Laos and, and that was destroyed by an earthquake and they haven't been able to rebuild it. But you can have a, a, a bunch of Buddhist or Hindu temples. There's only one place in the whole world where you can have sacrifices. Not just like one place like Israel or Jerusalem. No, there's like one specific spot you can have a temple. And it hasn't been rebuilt in 2,000 years. That's a pretty astounding thing if you think about it. Uh, I think one day, again, according to Scripture, it's going to be rebuilt again. It has to. But all of this has shown that Israel has not accepted the Messiah, and they've been under this. So what, what did God say would happen before the day of the Lord? One of the things that you're going to read about next Saturday is that Elijah would come. Malachi says, before the great, he says, uh, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, we understand he wasn't talking about like a reincarnate Elijah. He was talking about John the Baptist who came in the spirit of Elijah. Jesus explained that. That's the first thing that would happen. But the second thing that would happen is that God would pour out his spirit on his people. So look at chapter 2, verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all your flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit." It would not just be that God would show himself, but that he would come to live in his people. Part of what we are experiencing now is a precursor for the day of the Lord. And he would bring deliverance through Jerusalem. What does that mean? I think that's talking about the crucifixion of Christ, the cross of Calvary. I think that's talking about the deliverance for the world is this idea of what happened in Jerusalem when Jesus died on the cross? And it was this omen that shook the people on the day of Pentecost. So going back to Acts chapter 2, where Zach read this morning, there's a reason I had him read that. It seems so obscure, and well, why are we reading this? But the, the people are gathered in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. It's been 50 days since Jesus died, and now here they are back in Pentecost. And all of a sudden, this group of people, it could have been 12, probably it was more like 110 or more people that were there, and all of a sudden they start speaking in other languages in the Temple Mount. And all the people are wondering, what does this mean? And some people who are cynical, ah, oh, these people are drunk. Sure, 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 110 drunk people at not even three in the afternoon. <laughs> that was unheard of. As Paul gets up, or Peter gets up and Peter says, no, they're not drunk. This is what God said would happen before the day of the Lord, that he would pour out his spirit on his people. And that young men, young women would prophesy. Old men, old women would dream dreams. They'd see visions. This is God manifesting himself before he manifests himself. This is the day of the Lord where God comes and lives in his people before he comes back to live on the earth with his people. This is the precursor, and this is what freaked everybody at the day of Pentecost out. Because later on, they say in verse 37, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Okay, because I know what happens. The Spirit of God is poured out, and then 
the, the moon turns to dark and the sun turns to blood and, and all these things are going to happen, and, or the opposite, and, and all these things in heaven, and I don't, want, I don't want to be caught on the other side of the day of the Lord. And so what does Peter say? Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. All this is going to be for you as well, for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. People began calling on the name of the Lord. And as they repented and as they uh, called on the Lord, they were saved. And as they were saved and they were baptized and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, the same thing happened. Thus, believers are a part of the picture of all of what God is doing. Do you understand that the giving of the Holy Spirit was part of the day of the Lord? What's the day of the Lord? The day of the Lord is when God comes to earth. Has God come to the earth yet? Well, Christ is not yet here, but God is on the earth. God has come before the day of the Lord into your heart. God has given you not just, oh, you can be saved now. Yes, okay, I'll forgive your sins. That would have been enough, but it was... What he wanted is to pour his spirit out on us so that the day of the Lord is here. The last 2,000 years have been all of God's manifesting himself in us. And this means then, again, for us as Christians, that people ought to see a, some kind of manifestation of God in us. That, that when people see Christ in you, when people see the power of God working in and through you, to see that you are a different kind of person, that your Christianity is more than just a set of beliefs that you've ascribed to, but that it's an actual relationship where God is changing you, that you are no longer like you, but you are more like Jesus Christ, that is in some way part of this day of the Lord where God's going to manifest himself. And do you understand that by your manifesting God living through you, by your allowing the Holy Spirit to lead and to show himself to other people through you, that you can make a difference for those people on the actual day of the Lord. I don't know when Christ is coming back. I know that when the clock starts, then I can tell you. I don't know when the clock starts. But do you understand you have an opportunity uh, you have a responsibility. This is part of what we're talking about this month with missions, to be a manifestation of the day of the Lord, to be able to say there is a day coming when you will be judged by God, but you don't have to hear that guilty verdict. You can hear, well done. You can hear, forgiven. You can hear, paid in full. And the day when Christ is fully manifested can be mitigated and changed by the day that the Holy Spirit manifested, the day you got saved. That's an important part of prophecy. This, it's, it could have, again, it could have just been where God said, I will come and I will do all these things. But isn't it a great thing? He says, I want to show myself first in my people. Amen. That is part of what the day of the Lord means. And we get to be a part of all of that prophecy that, that God is manifesting. That is an awesome privilege, one that we shouldn't take lightly. So, so let's not.